And as we noted at the end of last time, the ending, phi C E, is the class ending. So that's how we know it's the class and not the division. The division we're working on is the chlorophyta. And there are three classes in that, chlorophyce, olophyce, and charophyce. And the next two weeks, we'll do those three classes and go on to our next group of organisms after the green algae. The chlorophyce have a number of characteristics that make them unique and a number of characteristics that are shared with the chlorophyta. So a unique characteristic is the cell division involving a phycoplast. Remember what a phycoplast is? It's those accessory microtubules that are parallel to the cell plate. So accessory microtubules parallel to the cell plate. And they occur in the case where we have cell division, as it occurs in many algae, cell division where the nuclei remain close together, the nuclei, the nuclear membrane remains intact during nuclear division, and there is a short-lived spindle, a normal spindle but there are some accessory microtubules in those cases and they're called the phycoplasts. And that occurs in the chlorophyce. Nuclear envelope persists during meiosis, mitosis and meiosis actually. They're freshwater organisms. That's not exclusive to this group, but this group is pretty much exclusively freshwater. So chlorophyce are found in the freshwater. The radial modal cells and the Flagella inserted apically, these are characteristics of the chlorophyta. So these are characteristics of the division. Monobionic haploid life cycles, that's also a pretty good characteristic for the chlorophyce. And related to that, these two characteristics are very closely related, is the dormant zygote. So the zygote's produced, it's going to undergo meiosis but it undergoes a period of dormancy before meiosis. So there's a resting period in the zygote. So that's the function of the zygote. It preserves the organism in this resting state, and, and meiosis occurs in there. Also very characteristic of the chlorophyce is something that it lacks, and it lacks an enzyme. The enzyme is glycolate oxidase. This is an enzyme that occurs in all higher plants, and it's going to occur in one of the other classes, the charophyce, class that's most closely related to the higher plants. It's an enzyme that functions in photorespiration. And I'm going to have to let you look up photorespiration. It's not even covered in your textbook very well. You don't need to know in detail anything about photorespiration. You need to know it involves the enzyme glycolate oxidase. And it's the combination of oxygen with enzymes of the Krebs cycle to produce CO2. So it's a kind of an inefficient process that happens in the higher plants. Oxygen combining with enzymes of the Krebs cycle by a glycolate oxidase, and CO2 is produced in that case. Let's start looking at the cell, at the organisms and about the structure of the cells. This is Chlamydomonas, spelled down here. <coughs> it's the unicellular green algae, and it is the green algae whose cell structure is repeated in all of the other lower modal green algae. So all of the colonial organisms we're going to see in just a minute have the exact, pretty much exactly the same cell structure. They've just got this cell structure of Chlamydomonas, like individual Chlamydomonas cells, and they're stuck together in a gelatinous sheath to make a colony. So understanding the structure of the Chlamydomonas cell is important for understanding the structure of all these other organisms. So we'll spend a couple minutes on it. We can see at the anterior end of the cell, anterior means in front, and anterior is in the direction of movement. we have the flagella. There's two flagella, singular is flagellum. The word flagellum means whip in Greek. So flagellum, whip. And you can see that they function kind of as whips. They pull the organism through the water. The posterior end of the organism is the end opposite the anterior. Posterior means back. 
<coughs> and you can see that the chloroplast is the main organelle in that part of the organism. Well, in fact, the chloroplast wraps around most of the organism. Let's get our highlighter here and we'll highlight in yellow the chloroplast. So it's very large and cup-shaped. We're seeing a section through it. So that's the chloroplast, a section through the chloroplast, cup-shaped chloroplast in all of these cells. The prenoid is inside the chloroplast. I wanted the felt tip pen, not the highlighter. And this area here, that's the prenoid. It's, an en it's a dense concentration of enzymes. that function in the production of starch. So it's the, the prenoid, at least in this group, is the site of star, starch production. And those are the starch grains then surrounding it. I can grab another color here and show you these then our starch grains. I hope you can see that. You can't see that color any very well. Switch to blue. These colors look quite different on my screen than they do on your screen on the front of the class. So I hope you can see the blue there. These are all starch grains. The starch grains are synthesized and occur inside the chloroplast. So that's not always going to be the case in other groups of algae, but it is in the green algae, it is in the chlorophyce. They're, in, they're synthesized and are stored inside the chloroplast. I think you'll remember that from one of the characteristics of the chlorophyta. Of course, we've got our normal structure, cell structures, the nucleus, the nucleus, the goji, the mitochondrion. We won't talk about those. There's the contractile vacuole, which is somewhat unique to these organisms. Not completely unique, but it functions in the osmotic regulation of the cell content. The root osmo means pushing or thrusting. And you know, certainly from introductory biology, but perhaps from other classes, that inside the cell we have a concentration of solutes, and that concentration of solutes causes water to flow into the cell. Now, water will continue to flow into the cell until the concentration of solutes inside the cell is exactly the same as an equilibrium with the concentration of solutes outside the cell. And basically that never happens. And so the cell, if there wasn't some regu if there wasn't some way to regulate this flow of water, the cell would just burst. The, os the contractile vacuole is how that regulation takes place. It pushes the water out. All that water that's flowing in it has a little pore through which it, it um, pumps the water out, the extra water that's coming in through osmosis. So that's the basic structure of these cells. We've looked at them in a diagram. We can also look at them in an electron micrograph. We'll see exactly the same structure. Here are the flagella at the anterior end. Here's the prenoid. kind of at the posterior end with these very large starch grains. Stored inside the chloroplast. It's a little hard to see the chloroplast here. You 
my yellow showing up, not very well, but a little bit. But the same basic structure we saw before, this whole area then is chloroplast. The structure of the flagellum is a typical eukaryotic flagellum. It has the nine plus two microtubule structure. in the flagellum. So that's a cross-section of the flagellum. We don't see the contractile vacuole here. And we, there's also one other thing that I forgot to mention, but we, and we can see it up here in the light micrograph. First of all, let's look at the prenoid. There's the prenoid again. Shows up very clearly here. You can see the flagella. And the last thing I wanted to mention was let me grab another color. This little spot here. That spot is called the spot. Stigma. Stigma means spot. In Greek, we're going to see that word again throughout the semester used to refer to certain limited localities in different organelles, in different parts of um, the organisms. But here there's a little spot spot, and that spot is light sensitive. So Chlamydomonas can travel toward the light, and it knows where the light is because it has a light sensing organ, and that is the stigma, a little tiny dot of pigment there. And we can see that stigma. Now, I can't write on the slide, and it's very dark on the screen. But we can see here the stigma quite clearly there, in fact, more clearly than pretty much anything else. And here is the uh, flagellum on this side. Here's a, the second diagram or movie on this screen shows a confocal microscope view through the chloroplast. And you can see that we're focusing up and down through the chloroplast here. And this is to show you that it's a cup-shaped chloroplast. So when we see kind of this circle, that's on the surface of the, of the chloroplast. When you see that dark area in the center, that's the lumen of the cell, the center of the cell where the nucleus would be. <clears throat> that's not fluorescing in this picture. And so you can see that it's hollow there. And then the prenoid is this kind of sloppish area down surrounded by red. So we can see the structure of the cells pretty well in these cases. Okay, Chlamydomonas, the structure and reproduction. I really want to say the reproduction of the cells. This diagram shows two kinds of reproduction, asexual reproduction <coughs> above here and sexual reproduction below the line. Asexual reproduction is simply by mitotic division. It's a simple unicellular organism. You can see it undergoing mitosis here to produce two new daughter cells identical to the parent cell. Sexual reproduction is a little more complex, but still not too bad. I mean, but how much can you do with a unicellular organism? First thing to understand, though, about these diagrams on unicellular reproduction is that these first two diagrams, this one and this one, these, these show petri dishes. So there's two petri dishes shown here. And then starting here, we see the organisms. So in this first petri dish, we have two mating strains, a plus mating strain and a minus mating strain. And we show in the second Petri dish, clumping, which is just the prelude to sexual union here, clumping of the plus and the minus mating strains. The 
plus and minus mating strains. What's taking place in those clumps then is shown in the rest of these diagrams, beginning with the early process of syngamy. So we'll just label these two syngamy. It's not fertilization because it doesn't involve a large sessile egg and a small mobile sperm. This organism is isogamous or isogamous. When I say isogamous, I just emphasize the two roots, iso the same, gamous marriage, we did last time. So an isogamous union, in syngamy, the cytoplasms fuse, the nuclei fuse, and we get a zygote. And then that goes through a resting stage. And followed by meiosis. To produce our new haploid cells. So not really too complex. There are two other diagrams on this screen which we can separate off here with this red line and look at separately. Now, when I say we're going to look at these separately, I really don't want you to look at them too closely because we're not going to talk about climbing to mode. We're not going to talk about all the variability that occurs in climbing to modes. Pretty much all the variability that we're going to see in the other organisms in terms of the sexual way, way that sexual reproduction takes place could be studied in climbing to modes, but it just gets too much all at once. That is, climbing to monas also has oogamous reproduction. Here is an egg. One of the climbing to monas cells has swelled up and lost its flagella, and the other cells are coming to fertilize it. And here's a situation where we have an isogamy, an isogamy, that is, sexual reunion based on unequal size gametes. So this one's an isogamous, and this one's oogamous. So there are Chlamydomonas species that are both oogamous and or anisogamous. But as I say, we're not going to pay attention to those right now, even just put an X on them. We're just going to pretend like Chlamydomonas is all isogamous. And we'll see these other examples later on. I just talked about it here to reinforce those terms. And to show you something that's really important about organisms, and that is that they are incredibly diverse. So getting some feeling for the diversity of organisms is a goal of this course, and a key feature of how diversity works is that you'll find an organism which will enter some kind of a adaptive niche, like climbing pneumonas, a unit that's got this unicellular niche, right? It can swim around very easily mobile. Um, it's unicellular, as you'll see, the cells of the other colonial organisms easily break apart. Chlamydomonas functions just fine when it's not in a colonial situation, thus it can't break apart. So in some ways, maybe it's more adaptive than the colonial organisms. So it's found this nice niche what it does. And then you get variations on the theme within that. And so we find not just one type of reproduction in Chlamydomonas, but we find all three different types of sexual union that occur in different species of Chlamydomonas. And we can see this pattern repeated over and over again. If you even look at the oaks, if you look at the species of oaks that occur in the southeast, find it's not just one kind of oak we find, we find many kinds of oaks, exploiting that kind of oak niche, we might say, for that. And if we look further to the western, North Carolina, western United States oaks, again, we see more variation within that same genus. We know there are always oaks because they always have acorns. Uh, acorns are very distinctive for the genus Quercus, the genus o of oaks. So we see that pattern of um, a new coming into a new adaptive niche and then variation within that niche again and again and again when we look at this. And Chlamydomonas is just our first example of how that happens. Let's look at the life cycle of Chlamydomonas. We know that this life cycle is going to be monobionic haploid. because it 
at, it's in a group that has all monobionic haploid life cycles. And now our task is kind of to interpret what we see here in this diagram from your textbooks in terms of the standardized life cycles that we've been drawing. So if you don't remember the standardized life cycle, you might draw it out at this stage so you have it in your mind. So being able to draw those standard life cycles is going to be really important when you come to interpreting life cycles like this. I've just drawn it a minute ago, so I'm not going to draw it again right now. I'm going to point out the parts of it. Remember that there is a haploid and a diploid portion of the life cycle, and they're separated by, there's meiosis, and there's syngamy. Now syngamy is drawn in two stages here for reasons that don't make any sense at all. This process here is syngamy. So we'll just call it syngamy. So our horizontal line in this case would have meiosis on one side and syngamy on the other, and it's curved line on this diagram. But having identified those two central processes, we can now know that the lower part of the diagram, this is the diploid portion, and not too surprisingly we have, they call it the zygospore here, but it is the zygote in the diploid stage. That means the other stage has to be haploid, So we have the myospores, and over here, since we have syngamy, these must be the gametes. And now we have a problem. What's all that stuff in between? What's all this stuff? So here we have one of the things we have to deal with in this course, and that, that is the fact that every author draws their life cycles slightly differently. In fact, the same author drawing the life cycle for two different organisms draws the life cycle slightly differently. Sometimes not only slightly differently, sometimes a lot differently. So what they've done in this case is they've put asexual reproduction as part of the life cycle, in the life cycle. Now you know we don't usually do that. When we're drawing our life cycles, we usually put asexual reproduction outside the life cycle. So here I can sketch that for you very briefly here in this tiny little space in the center. I'll just show you that here's our very schematic life cycle. And we would place asexual reproduction like this. We would draw a little circle on the outside like that and label that. asexual reproduction. <coughs> but they haven't done that. They put it inside. And you can see that it's asexual reproduction because it involves mitosis and it involves going from one organism through mitosis to a whole bunch of organisms just mit through mitotic cell divisions. And you know how that chlamydomonas reproduces that way. Pandorina. We'll do one or two more organisms and take a break. Pandorina is our first colonial organism. Each of the cells is a essentially a Chlamydomonas cell. That is, the cells look just like Chlamydomonas, slightly different shape, but the internal cell structure is the same. They have two flagella not shown in these diagrams, so I'll draw some of them in. There's our flagella. And the cells are held together then by a gelatinous sheath, which does not show here. Just indicate that it, there is a gelatinous sheath around it. And does show over here. Now, what's going on over here in this side is that one of these cells is undergoing mitotic cell division. I'm just 
being sloppy and writing mitosis here. And we're getting a new colony formed. held together, these new colonies, by this gelatinous sheet. And this whole thing has been kind of squished, right? This, the colony has been squished here on the microscope slide. So it wouldn't look like this in, in life. It would look more like the individual organism, but each of those cells would now be multicellular from mitotic cell division, and each would then be released as a new colony. So this is the process of autocolony formation. one of the means of asexual reproduction that we talked about. And you remember our slide of uterina, it's just another species that's very similar to this. And now we can see, again, each of the individual cells there could divide and form a colony that's identical to the parent colony. So the autocolony formation could undergo this place. Now, the new students don't have the glasses, and most people didn't put them on right now, probably because you've seen this. You should get them out, though. We'll be looking at more three-dimensional things in just a minute. And so I've got two more pairs of glasses for the folks who just added the class. So we get autocolony form formation In these, in these cases, and then the colonies are released. Now there's a specific way in which these colonies are, are released and they're formed. If you were to count the number of cells in this parent, and to count the number of cells in each of these colonies, you'd find that they're equal. So that the organism is reproduced to be a copy of the parent, and so that the number of cells does not grow over time. So the number of cells in a colony does not increase over time. And you know, what do you know about botany? When, there's, when we have a new concept, then there's a term for that. Yes, there's a term for that. This is called, these colonies are called synovic. And this word is very confusing. This is going to be one of the most confusing terms you have this semester. And it's going to be confusing even when you know the roots of seno, because the roots aren't going to help you here. They're going to make you more confused. Seno means common. And that doesn't tell you anything. So you're going to have to just remember that a synovic colony is a colony that doesn't increase over time. No cell, it's got the same number of cells when it's initially formed as when it's an adult. It doesn't grow through mitotic cell divisions. Now why this is gonna be confusing is because we're gonna have another term next lecture. And that other term is gonna be senocytic, and it's gonna mean something completely different and it sounds almost exactly the same. In fact, you probably can't tell I said two different terms at this point. We'll just stay with synovic right now, but I'm just telling you, spend some time to remember what that term means now, because next week time, it's, you're going to get confused with another term. Gonium is almost exactly the same as pandorina. Godium is just to have slightly more cells in the colony. But we can see now, again, in gonium, we have a gelatinous sheet. surrounding the colony, that the cells look like chlamydomonas cells. Yeah. 
and that we have the union of gametes here in what looks to be an anisogamous union. One of those gametes is much larger than the others, but it's clear that they're both mobile because they both have flagella on them. But if you look in the literature, it says that gonium is isogamous. And then there's a footnote saying that the cells of the gametes can sometimes be different sizes. So why isn't that anisogamous? I have no idea. And all I can say is that science is a subject done by humans. And if you've had any experience with humans, you know they don't always make sense. So I would call this anisogamous, but it is in the literature as published as isogamous with different sized gametes. So the test wasn't called. I would not ask you that in kind of detail okay. on the test. I'm not going to ask you to memorize every little detail about these organisms. <clears throat> Here's the cells of the chloroplast of gonium. And again, this here three-dimensional glasses really help here. You can see very nicely that we've got the three-dimensional chloroplast. <laughs> and then the focus up and down. Again, look at these cells really look almost exactly identical to what we saw in Clamidomonas. You can see in the not very nice light micrographs on the right side that there's the gelatinous sheet is very clearly visible here in this probably full of like a few of the cells. Bolox is our next member and our last member of this mobile line. Again, this is a three-dimensional view. So if you put your glasses on, you can see that colony in three dimensions. There's some important things that we can notice about the colony of Volox. Now, it's got two very distinct sides to the colony. The colony is starting to show some differentiation. It's got an end of the colony where it's got these kind of green blobs in it. And there's an end of the colony where the green blobs are not. In fact, if we were to look at the cells, and the cells are those little green dots, the little tiny green dots are the individual cells of this colony. If we were to look at those individual cells, the cells at the side where these blobs of green are not, those cells have bigger stigmas. That is, the light reception of the colony is being carried out in that end of the colony more than it is in the other end. We're going to call that end of the colony, where there are not the blobs and where there are more light reception, the anterior end. When we have a colony, I can, a slide I can write on, I will write that down. The other end, where the blobs are, those blobs are asexual reproduction. That's asexual or sexual reproduction going on, asexual really, in this case. <clears throat> and so there's a second part of the colony, or a second side of the colony where asexual reproduction takes place and sexual reproduction. And that's going to be the posterior side. So there's differentiation in this colony that we haven't seen before. So we see here then the anterior and the posterior side of the colony. You can see that the individual cell are separated from each other. They're not held quite close as closely together as we've seen in the other colonies. And in fact, if we look, we'll see in a diagram, there are cytoplasmic connections between these cells. Here are our asexual reproduction. Here is asexual reproduction taking place. And I'll explain more about that in just one second. So differentiation, here's our cytoplasmic connections.
There are our flagella. And the cells, again, are look basically like a chlamydomonas cell. Cup-shaped chloroplasts, all the same intercellular structures that we show in chlamydomonas. There's, again, that kind of gelatinous sheath that surrounds them. Slightly different structure here, but it's still present. Surrounding these individual cells. OK, there's a lot on this on this slide. We've got asexual and sexual reproduction being represented here. And it's a little hard to separate them because of the way this is drawn, but basically it goes like this. Here's a asexual reproduction. And sexual is down here. So asexual reproduction is through a kind of autocolony formation. And those blobs that we've been talking about, those are the autocolonies. So they are initially contained inside the parent colony, and then they're released. Now, they are not released as is shown in this diagram. This diagram is someone taking a, um, <clears throat> a volvox colony and putting on a slide and squishing it so that the autocolonies are popped out of it so that you can see them clearly. But that is not how they're released. They're released like this. They turn inside out. So this autocolony is turning inside out through a little hole in the outside of the colony. So that means when it's inside the colony, as we saw in the last couple diagrams, the flagella are pointing into, into the inner part of that autocolony. And then it turns inside out and it's released, leaving the parent colony attack, intact. So look at sexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, again, there's still an anterior and a posterior end. And you can see in the posterior end, there are more of these cells which are going to function in sexual reproduction. If we take an enlargement of a section of this organism in the posterior end, we see here what are sperm packets. So this organism is going to be oogamous. And this is going to be a male colony. Over here, down here, we have a female colony. And there's a few, those two are the easiest to see, eggs that are present here. So the sperm packet is going to swim from the male colony to the female colony. There's the egg and fertilization will take place to produce our zygote. Is this all in the gelatinous sheath? It's all inside that gelatinous sheath. In fact, the sperm packet has to release enzymes to dissolve to the gelatinous sheath. And if you look closely, you might be able to see it from back there. I can hear it. You can see the gelatinous sheath right in here. So right there, in that little area, is the gelatinous sheath. And if you can't see it here, look at your own computer, you'll see it. Yep? I have a question about the release. Um, so if they're basically inside out inside the cell, and they're flipped right side out whenever they're released, or uh, if they turn that way, um, whenever they're being released, is there a small hole that forms in which they turn inside yeah, out? Yeah, there's a little hole here. Uh, yeah, because I know a complete circle where you could yeah, there's a little hole that they come inside out of in both of the cells, the parent colony and the daughter colony. So that's the plate where they're attached to each other. So the clammy, sorry, I keep saying clammy demonics, the volvox colony is a hollow sphere. I didn't say that, but it's a hollow sphere. And so these things are inside that hollow sphere. So clammy I did it again. 
ball of oxy is all O-gammas. So it's our first whole gamma's organism. And I really better get moving. Pediastrum. Oh, by the way, Volvox is also the first organism that we've seen that is not synovic. It's the first non-synovic colony. It continues to grow throughout its life. Pediastrum. PD means um, flat or plain. Astrum star. And that's what it looks like. It's got a number of cells. They're always in a multiple of two, two to 128 cells. You might think about why it's always an even multiple of two here. And so they can have various sizes. The individual colonies, though, are synovic. But there are no flagella on the colony. So there are no flagella. So that it is non-mobile. Now, even though it's non-mobile, when the thing, when this organism goes to reproduce, it does produce flagella. <clears throat> so, in many cases, we're going to see that sexual asexual reproduction takes place through zoospores. We've also seen that has auto colonies occur in the colonial organisms. And Pediastrum is one of those organisms, one of the few ones, that has both zoospores and autocolonies. And just roughly, I'll give you a rough idea of how that works. When asexual reproduction is starting to take place, the cells of the colony produce a kind of bag. The cell wall extends, and the cell contents divides to produce a number of zoospores. And those zoospores then swim around within that little bag and settle down to produce a new colony, the new auto colony, which is synovic and will not grow after it's produced. So this kind of asexual reproduction, and this is asexual that I've just described, is reproduced again in sexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction takes place in a similar way. I'm not going to go through all the details of it. It gets a little complex. But the same kind of thing is involved. The gametes are released into this extended cell wall, and syngamy takes place within that. And then the new colony will form. Hydrodictyon is another member of the same group that contains pediastrum, pediastrum. The only difference between hydrodictyon and pediastrum is the shape of the colony. Here it's a net. In fact, it's even a three-dimensional net. Can have cylinders <clears throat> made of these nets. And so here's an individual cell here. But look back here, you see another set of cells behind it. So it can be this three-dimensional cylindrical net structure. All the asexual reproduction, sexual reproduction in Pediastrum and Hydrodictyon, they're exactly the same. The shape of the colony is what di differentiates them. Ulthrix is our first filamentous organism. And this is the organism with the band-shaped chloroplast. Maybe you can see that here. There's the band, it runs around. I probably obscured it a little bit there, but you can see it a bit. Ulthrix will grow with a hold fast, which there means there is a cell at the base of this that's got kind of a root-like structure, and it will allow it to 
grab on to something else. It doesn't take nutrition from through this whole vast, but it grabs on. And the growth of this colony is by any cell can divide, generalized cell division. So it grows through generalized cell division. These colonies are not synovic. In fact, that makes perfect sense if we say that they have generalized cell division. Any cell can divide to elongate the colony. And they reproduce by asexual reproduction. Now, there's several kinds of asexual reproduction. But on all filaments, we find fragmentation it is an important method of asexual reproduction. So the filament can just break and continue to grow. And that works particularly well for these organisms with generalized cell growth, where any cell can divide. Three dimensions again, we see our band-shaped chloroplast. We saw this moving one already before. The other ones you see really nice light micrographs, and you can kind of get a sense here that the chloroplast is band shaped. And then the other two, you see that perhaps even more clearly than the moving pictures, you can see the nice band shaped chloroplast with the cell walls here not fluorescing, so being dark. Again, the center part of these cells is composed of the vacuole, so uh, the, cell, the chloroplast is pushed to the outside. You also see the prenoid there, that dark area is the prenoid, the site of starch production. Here's asexual and sexual reproduction through zoospores. This is asexual reproduction. And this is a zoospore, an animal spore. It's produced by the cytoplasm of the cell, just one of the, some of the cytoplasm rounds up and is released from the filament. And it loses its flagella it settles and we're getting you see the growth mitotic growth sexual reproduction same basic idea we get rounding up of the cytoplasm. And they're going to produce the zygotes. See there's a difference in the number of flagella in the zoospore 4 and the zygotes 2. I'm never going to ask you to reproduce that, but I just pointed out that you can tell them apart. And they fuse in syngamy. I said zygotes, that's supposed to be gametes. Here's the zygote. So the gametes, of course, are haploid. And the zygote is 2N. Etagonium. Etos, swelling. Gonium, reproductive structure. gives us our same root as gonads. In Eogonium, we have this one really big cell that you might suspect, and you'd be right, is the egg. So Eogonium is oogamous. It's the first oogamous organism that is a filament. This filament has a particular kind of growth. It has a growth only certain cells can divide in this filament. And so we say the growth is intercalary. Inter means between.
Cellari or C-E-L-L -L means inserted. So in intercalary means inserted between. So the idea here is that we've got cells like this one, which aren't going to divide, and then cells here that will divide. And this, so it's intercalary growth. So we still go, we're still going to have fragmentation as a major type of asexual reproduction and as sexual reproduction oogamy. And we'll see the sperm in just a second. Here's the chloroplast of Edegonium. This is the one with the reticulate chloroplast, the ones that are um, kind of like a network. And you can see that a little bit here in the light micrographs on the left. Even better on the really nice three dimensional picture on the right. Again, it's chloroplast those curves here that it's pressed around the outside of the cell. And you can see there's a chloroplast that. It's got this reticulate structure. And you can see that again here in the confocal picture. We're showing fluorescence of the chloroplast. Here we're looking in the center of the cell. Now it's coming up to the outer part of the cell. You saw the nucleus there, around there. And you can see that the chloroplast has that reticulate structure. When you get up to the surface of the cell, you see something that looks very much like the green fluorescence picture. So remarkable chloroplasts in Edegonium. So there are there is the egg and the sperm here, and we might as well learn a couple new terms for this. So there's a term for the reproductive structure that contains the egg, and that is called the OO egg gonium reproductive structure. And the structures that contain the sperm are called the anther idiom, antheridium. Anther, you're never going to believe this, means flower. And idiom means small. And I will explain later in the class why it's so appropriate to refer to the male parts as the little flower. <laughs> So here we have the oogonium again and the antheridium. And the antheridium then is just going to, each of the cells is going to produce a sperm cell. The oogonium is going to produce the egg. These are very simple structures in this case. In other organisms, we're going to see the antheridium and oogoniums are going to be very complex. But here they're extremely simple. Here's the sperm. You can see the sperm in this case has got many, many flagella, and it's being released from the cell in the antheridium. In most cases in Edegonium, the male and the female are on the same Are on the same filament, but in some cases, we can have really small males and this filament here is actually bisexual a larger female and male together, and sometimes that'll just be the female. So there's a lot of variability in how they form. We're going to mainly be concerned with this case where the male and the female are on the same filament. Again, here's the female, the oogonium, which is going to contain the egg, and the male, the antheridium, which is going to contain the sperm. Here's the case I was just talking about. This are the dwarf males. And they are growing on, right on top of, very close to the female filament. I guess that's what they said. Nice work if you can get it right there next to the girl. 
the dwarf male. So very strong heterogeneity in the size of the organisms. Chlorella, we might make this. Ella is a diminutive ending. A diminutive ending means that the ending means little. And chlor, you know, it means green. Little green. So this is a really tiny, little bitty green cell. In fact, when you look at this in lab, you're going to see all kinds of other things that aren't these cells because you're going to be looking for things that are 10 times bigger than this cell. This is a really tiny little cell. They are named little green for a very good reason. They are very small cells. There's no flagella. The chloroplast is cup-shaped, and this is all chloroplast here. So it's a chlor cup-shaped chloroplast, like in Chlamydomonas. Other structures of the cell are very similar to Chlamydomonas, the flagella and the no stigma, again, because no movement of this cell, no flagella. And it reproduces by mitotic cell division. Only asexual reproduction is known in this organism. So it was no sexual cycle that's known. So that's basically the structure and the cell division of chlorella. Our last organism is Scanidesmus. Scanidesmus. This is a really cool organism. It's related to chlorella. So there are, again, no flagella. Oh, I need to go back to chlorella for one second and tell you what the name of these cells are. You know that when we have a colony and the colony reproduces itself, it's called an autocolony. And so when you have a cell that's not a colony and it reproduces an exact identical version of itself, we don't, can't call that an autocolony because it didn't start with a colony. We call that a, a spore, an autospore. So these are the autospores. We mentioned we would see autospores. You know, as I always say, it's not science if you don't have a term for it. So there we go, autospores. No flagella in Scanodesmus. This is another synovic colony. The number of cells in the colony differ in different species. Some species, not all of them, but the ones we're going to see have these projections from the end of the cells, these little horns on them, which really makes these cool looking colonies. And they reproduce again by autocolony formation. So in other words, each of those cells is going to divide by mitotic cell division to produce a new colony identical to the parent colony. There's no sexual cycle known in this organism. <clears throat> 